The Bristol Channel is a treacherous waterway to navigate. It has massive tidal range, impenetrable murky waters and numerous submerged hazards. And the coastline here is especially dangerous. Little more than a mile out to sea is Tusker Rock, a black jagged rock that stays submerged below the sea line during high tide. Dusk and nighttime navigation along this stretch used to be mainly achieved by setting a course and keeping an eye out for the lights of the village of Newton, which signal that you were clear of the rocks. This was far from a scientific solution and it kept the scavenging coastal living folk of the Vale of Glamorgan in a plentiful supply of plunder washed up on the beaches from the wreckage of merchant ships. Depths where death's shore hath no luster, ships splinter wide and souls cry out on the blackened Some took it upon themselves to unduly influence the number of wrecks without any qualm or thought to the lives they were endangering in the process. With the tragic irony, the most prolific of these was a man who, in his earlier life, had sought to be the saviour of the victims of shipwrecks. And this is where he lived. Today we are at Southern Down Beach and more particularly at Dunraven Castle. We are here to tell a pretty spectacular story of a man who lived here in the 16th century. A man whose dastardly deeds are now notorious through Glamorgan folklore. But we're also going to talk a little bit about how it is that we have this remarkable story. And the work of a man called Yoro Morganog, who was employed as the resident bard at this castle, because it is from him that we get this story. The ruins of Dunraven Castle had a layer of romantic mystery to this place. What you can see here are the remains of a very grand stately home. It was the seat of the Wyndham Quinn family, the Earls of Dunraven, who grew very rich from the local coal fields just north of Bridgend. They were big fans of Welsh culture, literature and legend, which is why they employed their own resident bard. Fun fact, by the way, the flock of ravens that live at the Tower of London were a gift from the Earl of Dunraven to Queen Victoria. This was just the last in a long line of castles which stood on this site down the ages. There's been a castle on the headland between Dunraven Beach and Southern Down Beach since the Iron Age. Legend has it that the original Iron Age hill fort was the home of Caradog, king of the Silures, who repelled Roman invasion for over a decade. In fact, the name Dunraven may well be a corruption of the Welsh Din Driven, meaning triangular hill fort, which aptly describes the outline of the old structure. The next castle to be built here was a 12th century fort built by Arnold de Boteler. In the mid 16th century, this was modernized and incorporated into a Tudor mansion. And it was during this period, it was the home of the Vaughan family. We know this as it was recorded by John Leyland when he visited in 1536. The mansion's situation perched on top of the sheer cliffs of Southerndown, with its facade gazing out to sea across the treacherous Tusker Rock made it the perfect retreat for a shipwrecker. But for Walter Vaughan, things nearly turned out so differently. Now, Walter Vaughan had had a great start in life. He was born into a wealthy family. He could afford to buy a castle. Things were looking good. Then things started to go horribly wrong for the man. First of all, two of his children were killed in a sailing accident just off the coast here in the Bristol Channel. Then his wife died of a fever. And slowly, surely, he started to descend into a Great Depression where vices were all that sustained him. Vices like gambling and prostitution. And eventually, the family fortune was all but squandered. Outraged by this cycle of loss and depravity and despairing that he'd become unbearable to live with, his one surviving son left home to seek out his fortune and his daughter disowned him. Alone and threatened with financial ruin, he turned to an unlikely source for help, a local pirate, smuggler and ne'er-do-well who lived in the Brufton Monk Nash area and went by the name of Matt of the Iron Hand. Walter Vaughan gave him free reign of his estate which spanned the clifftops east of the castle. It was on these clifftops that Matt organised teams to tie lanterns to the tails of grazing sheep, replicating the appearance of the lights of Newton. Seeing these lanterns, passing ships would think they'd passed the dangers of the rocks and would be lured onto Tusker Rock. The nearest beaches were also part of Vaughan's private estate and Matt's teams would rummage unchallenged through the spoils 
and corpses washed ashore. Whatever they gathered, they would split between Matt of the Iron Hand, his henchman, and Walter Vaughan. Wrecking is a grisly business. The law said that you could only reclaim what you found on the beach if there were no survivors. So it was vested upon wreckers to ensure that there were no survivors, which meant if you found anyone alive, unfortunately, you were to dispatch them. And also made sure they weren't able to identify you to the authorities. There was one detail in this relationship that Vaughan was not aware of. Matt of the Iron Hand earned his unusual name on account of the iron hook that he had in place of a severed hand. What Vaughan did not know was that many years earlier it was he as magistrate who had ordered bailiffs to capture Matt for piracy and it was during the scuffle of his arrest that the hand had been cut off. Vaughan didn't recognise him but Matt of the Iron Hand was all too aware of his past encounters with his new business partner. The alliance between Walter Vaughan and Matt of the Iron Hand was a fruitful one. Over time they amounted vast halls of treasure. The gambling debts were settled and soon the family coffers were full once more. Vaughan began to lament the rift with his son and reached out to him and after some years his son agreed to return home in a bid to mend their rift. In the time he had been away he had travelled extensively and had grown into an educated and wealthy man in his own right. A few weeks before he was expected home there was a violent storm. The light burned particularly bright in the tower that night and before dawn broke the unmistakable sound of a ship splintering against the black rocks below was heard echoing around the bay. Walter grinned turned over and slept, knowing in the following morning there would be a bounteous booty waiting for him on the beach. He sent word to Matt to send his cohorts down onto the beach the following day to retrieve whatever had washed ashore. The haul they brought up to the house was one of the best they had ever seen, and Walter Vaughan wanted to go down to the beach to see for himself. Walter walked onto this beach and found lying at the far end the corpse of a man dressed in silks and velvet and all the fineries of the age. Oh, how his son would love to have clothes like that. He went to the corpse to remove what he could salvage and to his horror, as he turned the body over, it was the body of his own son. His throat had been slit from ear to ear. So clearly, he had survived the wreck, but was dispatched by one of his own accomplices. The legend has it, at the end of this tale, that on the anniversary of his son's death, the ghost appears at the far side of Dunraven Beach down here below me. Walter Vaughan himself appears on the other side and holds out his arms thus, begging for his son's forgiveness. His son turns and shuns him, and with an anguished wail, Walter raises his hands to heaven and disappears into the night. So, how do we have this story? I mentioned earlier on about Yolo Morgano. Yolo Morgano, whose real name was Edward Williams, was an antiquarian and historian, but mainly marked himself as a bard, a storyteller. Uh, and he had a few MOs that make it clear that this story is one of his. We also know that the Wyndham Quinn family, who lived here at Dunraven Castle, employed him as a resident bard. So he had a vested interest in coming up with as many stories about this place as he possibly could. One of the things he used to do that made it very difficult for us to distinguish between legend and real history was he would never sign his work. He would claim that they were discovered, therefore keeping that little air of mystery that they might be a genuine historical record. The other thing he used to do was use characters in his story, in this instance, Walter Vaughan, who were real characters, whose graves you can discover, whose birth certificates you can discover. Uh, he did a similar thing with the Maid of Kevin Edver uh, and the characters central to that story. 
and also many, many others across Glamorgan. He essentially had a love affair with Glamorgan and was very jealous at how all the great legends seemed to be about Pembrokeshire and Gwynedd. So he wanted to bring some of that magic here. And what you've just heard, I think, is a pretty great example of that magic. I really hope you enjoyed this video, and if you love myths, legends and folklore, then you may be interested to know that you can read more about the Wreckers of Dunraven and countless other similar stories in these two books, Legends and Folklore of Bridgend and the Vale, and More Legends and Folklore from Barry Bridgend and the Vale. They're both available from all good bookshops from Amazon or direct from the author at www.grahamlovelockedwards.com. Alternatively, if the written word is not for you, then please subscribe to my YouTube channel at user Graham Lovelock, which is packed with videos about myths, legends, folklore and stories from Welsh history. So until the next time we meet, please enjoy your history. Music